Imagine a lone merchant freighter making its journey across the Atlantic, carrying cargo bound for Great Britain. The captain suddenly spots another ship through his binoculars. The colors of the flag, the markings on the hull, they all indicate just another harmless trader. Yet something is off. The unknown ship is rapidly overtaking the merchant. Realizing the danger, the captain increases speed, frantically transmitting the emergency signal QQQQ, which indicates an attack, but no help is near. In ominous silence, the unknown vessel draws alongside the merchant. Then it lowers the false flag and rolls up the swastika. Cargo hatches and camouflage nets are torn down, exposing an arsenal of heavy guns. It sends a single message in international code. Stop immediately. Do not scuttle. Do not use the wireless. If you disobey, we open fire. I'm Indy Nidell, and this is a World War II special episode about the Cormoran and German commerce raiders. The Germans called them Störkreuzer. They had risen to prominence during the Great War as improvised auxiliary cruisers. Ships like Wolf, Merve, and Sea Adler roamed the high seas as, as a phantom menace, paralyzing the Allies' trade routes with daring and deception. They concealed their true identities and their whereabouts to ambush unaware liners, steamers, colliers, and tankers. When the German Kriegsmarine began to build up again in 1935, the legends of those ships were still very much alive. And if war should break out again, the German Navy would once more resort to the auxiliary cruiser strategy, but this time with more sophistication. One of the most prolific German merchant raiders of the Second World War was the Cormoran. Cormoran's four nine-cylinder diesel engines powering electric motors allowed for a top speed of 18 knots, which could pretty easily overtake most merchant vessels. A corridor was built down the length of the ship, allowing sailors to secretly man their stations before the action started. Six heavy 5.9-inch guns were hidden behind false hull plates, metal panels, or cargo hatch walls, which could be quickly torn down. Secondary armaments consisted of repurposed anti-aircraft and anti-tank guns, which were camouflaged amidst the structure of the ship, or even individually raised to the deck via hydraulic lifts. Additionally, Cormoran was armed with torpedo tubes, two dual launcher at the upper deck, and one underwater tube on each side of the ship. Cormoran also carried a payload of mines with the intention of laying them around allied ports in India or Australia. The new auxiliary ships were also modified with a sick bay, livestock pens, storage for spare parts and torpedoes, and even reconnaissance float planes, although no catapult because a peaceful merchant ship carrying a plane catapult would be really suspicious. The first task of every German commerce raider was to pass through the blockade of the British Royal Navy and enter the Atlantic Ocean. They had two routes, the short but dangerous one directly through the English Channel, where they could rely on only minor cover provided by the Luftwaffe and captured French coastal batteries. The longer but less patrolled route went to the north around the Faroe Islands. With a disguise as the Soviet freighter Vyacheslav Molotov, Cormoran chose the latter and by mid-December 1940 successfully reached the Atlantic. Although each raider was assigned a specific area of operation, they were granted a significant amount of individual freedom. Now, in contrast to the U-boats, the merchant raiders stayed as far from the convoy routes as possible. The busy routes were ideal hunting grounds for the wolfbacks, but the raiders aimed at single vessels out of range of armed escorts. There were rules, of course, to privateering, though. Neutral ships were a, a no-go, but yeah, neutrality, you know, that's a fickle thing. Until the end of 1941, raiders were ordered to operate strictly outside the Pan-American security zone to not risk attacking American vessels. Greek ships, on the other hand, Greece was neutral before the Italian and German invasions, were openly trading and carrying cargo for the Allies. They were usually attacked without much leniency. Swedish ships were also neutral, but they were often chartered by the British. They were more often boarded and checked without resorting to hostilities. Much of it all depended on the personal judgment of the raider's captain. He chose a course of action, and when it was worth risking his ship. Several aspects must be considered before attacking a potentially armed vessel. What flag does the target fly? 
Does the ship behave suspiciously? Sailing away at top speed, moving in zigzag lines or without lights, all of that could hint at the target carrying something precious or that it feared being attacked beyond the ordinary. A merchant carrying timber would most likely surrender without a fight, but a ship carrying airplane parts might choose to fight back. The last thing a raider wanted was a lengthy firefight. Trading blows was never worth it, as a heavily damaged raider had no other choice but to make the long journey home to be refitted. Torpedoes and ammunition were also limited and costly, and expending expensive shells just to sink a ship full of soap was not a favorite outcome. The best possible outcome was the quick and peaceful surrender of the surprise target. Captains who realized that they could neither outrun nor outgun the raider would usually surrender pretty quickly. When the captain of the raider had decided that the hunt was on, the well-trained crew knew what to do. Disguised under a false flag and sending out false identity signals, the raider would shadow its target. When it was close enough for interception, the raider's superior speed would then allow it to close the distance swiftly. Once alongside at point-blank range, the raider's crew would drag down the camouflage and expose and train its guns on the merchant. Radio and light signals ordered the victim to stop or else. Upon failure to comply with the warning, the raider would fire a warning shot. If that still wasn't heated, or if the merchant tried to resist by sending out a distress call or manning its own guns, all bets were off. The attacker would fire until the ship was either disabled or the crew surrendered. Afterwards, it was boarded by armed sailors to learn the details of the captured vessel. Documents of identity, destination, and cargo tonnage were confiscated, as were code books. If a vessel carried especially valuable cargo and had enough fuel for the journey, it was seized as a prize and brought back to the continent's ports. If not, then it was sunk with demolition charges. The captured crew would usually be kept in prepared rooms on the raider and later transferred out to supply ships. Using that approach, the Cormoran successfully sunk eight merchant ships on its journey down the African coast. By the end of April 1941, it had changed its disguise to that of a Japanese freighter and slipped into the Indian Ocean. Changing identities and codes from time to time was really important to deny the enemy a chance to profile them. The commerce raiders carried a lot of materials to change their appearance, even something big like, like another funnel. Outside of the hunt, they had to behave like regular merchants as well, entering and leaving ports and using fake hailing signals to not raise the suspicion of Allied warships. Cormoran continued its journey to the Maldives and the Bay of Bengal, where it laid mines on the routes to Madras and Calcutta. Before the end of September, it attacked three more ships. First, a Yugoslavian merchantman, which failed to heed the warning shot and had to be shelled to stop. Then, an Australian freighter, which was bombarded to immobilization after trying to send out distress signals, and then a Greek ship that thought it was being pulled over by a British cruiser for inspection. All in all, typical work for a raider. But soon the tables would turn. It was on November 19th, 1941, just 150 nautical miles off the coast of Western Australia, that Cormoran spotted a smokestack on the horizon. But what was hoped to be another lonely freighter turned out to be the HMAS Sydney, an armored cruiser. Cormoran immediately turned around, trying to speed away unnoticed, but it was too late. Sydney was on intercept course. Now Cormoran was in a tight spot. It could neither have a fair fight with, nor outrun, an armored cruiser. Its only chance seemed to be maintaining the disguise of a harmless merchant in the hope that Sydney bought it. Cormoran continued to issue fake call signs and even sent out a misleading distress call. But Sydney continued coming closer while inquiring about cargo and destination. When it was on a parallel course, just 1,300 meters away, it asked once more for identification, demanding the secret secondary call sign. The problem was no one on Cormoran knew it. So the German sailors instead raised the battle flag and exposed their weapons. A devastating salvo descended on Sydney, whose forward gun turret and bridge were savaged. The raider's secondary armaments also hammered into the Australian warship, while a torpedo tore into its side. The surprise attack very nearly did the whole job, but Sydney was able to deliver one salvo of its own before her guns fell silent. 
Cormoran's exhaust funnel and wireless were hit, and shells ruptured the oil tank and the machinery. Cormoran kept firing as the mortally wounded Sydney limped away, but an uncontrollable fire inside the engine room forced Cormoran to a stop. She was dead in the water. If the fire reached the magazine, the whole ship would blow up, so the raider had to be abandoned and scuttled. Sydney as well disappeared beneath the waves. The mutual destruction of Cormoran and Sydney demonstrated both the strengths and the weaknesses of the German commerce raiders. A major warship was sunk by a much smaller vessel through deception and surprise. At the same time, it showed that the raiders were glass joes, who did not play in the same league as armored warships. Everything depended on their disguise, and if that didn't work anymore, then that was pretty much it. For the first half of the Second World War, the German merchant raiders roamed the seas largely unchallenged. Ships like Penguin, Tor, and Vida continued disrupting Allied shipping and tying up a large number of warships that were out looking for them. If the Allies wanted to safeguard their trade routes, they needed to step up their game. That meant increasing the strength of their convoys and the surveillance of the seas. Until then, the pirates would remain a deadly threat. We did a special episode on naval tactics and strategy in the Pacific a while back, and you can check that out right here. And check out the Time Goes Barracks for our line of collectibles. There's a lot of cool stuff there that you just don't yet realize you can't live without. See you next time. Mm -hmm.